welcome and a good afternoon to Women's Place UK Goes to the Movies. Um, I'm really excited to be here today to discuss But What Was She Wearing? And we're here, here with the filmmaker herself, Vaishnavi Sundar, and the wonderful Gita Segal as well. Um, my name is Ali Cisse. I'm absolutely honoured to be here today representing Women's Place UK and very excited to be introducing both of our guests. So a great, so a big welcome to Vaishnavi all the way from Chennai today. Um, Vaishnavi has a, a growing following in Britain for all of the feminist work she does in, Bright, in India um, for issues facing women and girls and how that intersects with caste, class, faith, and really fascinating stuff. Um, and it's obviously um, through her feature length documentary that we're all here today. Um, she's the founder of Women Making Films, also runs and owns her own production company, Lime Soda Films. Um, she will, I think, at some point speak a bit more because she, about the film that she's currently making, which is very interesting as well. Um, she also, I don't know if you follow her blogs, but she has an exceptional blog on YouTube. And I think the link should come up in the chat function. Um, all things what the fuck. It's brilliant, fresh, hilarious, and a really good take on liberal feminism and a really fresh look at things as they're happening in India as well, which is wonderful. So if you haven't, please do check that out. Um, we're also really excited to have Geeta Sagal here today, who's going to be curating the Q&A, uh, which will be wonderful. I think that Geeta will not need much of an introduction amongst our supporters here, um, which is good because I'm not really sure where I would begin or end because her body of work has been so enormous. Um, most people will know her from her time at Amnesty International. Um, they'll also know her from her time with South or Black Sisters. Um, and interestingly, um, Agita also has a history of documentary and filmmaking as well. Um, she's made films in the UK, Bangladesh, India. Um, again, similar feminist content. So she's looking at violence against women and girls. Um, she's looking at that within a context of faith and religious fundamentalism. She's also done some really fantastic stuff around um, dowry killings and the recent upsurge we've seen in the last decade of Sata killing, which obviously is the horrific ritual whereby a woman is placed on her husband's funeral part. Um, so it should be really interesting today seeing both Gita and Vaishnavi come together and discuss this. It just leaves me to say, if you haven't um, seen the documentary, but what was she wearing yet? Um, please, please, please do. All of the proceeds go directly to Vaishnavi. Um, and if you go onto your Eventbrite email, you should see the link to watch the film there. If you're watching this at a later date on a YouTube, there should still be a link underneath to watch the film. So on behalf of Women's Place UK, um, I will pass you over to Geeta and Vaishnavi. Thank you so much. Welcome. This is my first event uh, that I'm doing with a woman's place. So I'm really excited about that. And uh, I'm really pleased that all of you here, even if it's a slightly wet Sunday afternoon here in London, um, you know, there've been a lot of Zoom meetings and people have joined us from all over the world. And I promise you, it's going to be a really interesting conversation because I have watched the film and I've talked to Vaishnavi and she's a kick-ass feminist. And it is uh, going to be a conversation of also of different generations of feminism and about this film, about sexual harassment in the workplace in India. And we know that some of you will have watched the film and some won't have watched the film. So we've actually designed the conversation, as Ali said, as an appetite wetter. So if you have watched it, hopefully you'll understand it better. If you haven't watched it, then this is your introduction. It's not a substitute for watching it. It's an introduction to some of the background issues of the film, some of the things around the film. Um, and do go and watch it after the seminar at some point. I think the link will be up for some time. You have a reduced price code. The money is, Ali said, goes into 
filmmaking projects. And I can tell you as a filmmaker myself, it's bloody hard to raise money for independent films, and particularly if they don't fit the narrative of the donors. So, um, you know, with that, uh, I'm going to kick off with my first question to Vaishnavi to welcome you, first of all, Vaishnavi, to this conversation. Um, I'm really, really happy to be having this with you here because you've covered so many subjects very close to my heart. And one of them, a subject extremely close to my heart, is religious fundamentalism and the issues around religion and women. And your film starts with a quotation from a book called Manusmriti. So can you tell us what this book is, what this text is, and you know something of the background? Why do you start with that? Sure, thank you, Geeta. Thank you, Ali. Thank you, WPUK. This is such a privilege. And um, how I feel about this, I think, will take me a little bit of time to sink in, maybe after the conversation is over. And then I would be like, oh my God, I just did that. But as of now, my, my most sincere gratitude to all of you for having me um, this evening. So Manusmriti is basically Sanskrit for laws of Manu. And Manu is considered to be this ideal uh, man who lays out the rules for human beings to live, you know, this sort of a law, if you will. Um, it's also called Manava Dharma Shastra. Um, and it's traditionally the most authoritative of the books of the Hindu code. Uh, and it is attributed uh, to the first man and lawgiver, which is Manu, who's also considered to be one of the most um, touted man who everybody belonging to the Hindu religion looks up to. Um, the, the text dates uh, circa 100 CE. So it's, it's that old, but the, the, teachings or the inscriptions written in the document is followed in various aspects even today. I uh, would like to just read out a couple of uh, the quotes that are on Manusmriti that pertain to women that will sort of give you a sense of what it is that we're dealing with over here. It goes as this. Though destitute of virtue or seeking pleasure elsewhere, or devoid of good qualities, a husband must still be constantly worshipped as a god by a faithful wife. A faithful wife who desires to dwell after death with her husband must never do anything that might displease him who took her hand whether he be alive or dead. By violating her duty towards her husband, a wife is disgraced in this world she enters the womb of a jackal and is tormented by distress for her sin. And finally, having thus at the funeral given the sacred fires to his wife who dies before him, he may marry again and again kindle the fires. This is just some of the quotes that are written in Manushmiti and these are just some of it that pertain to women. Um, Hinduism um, is, you know, is a, is a religion of the majority uh, of people in India, and uh, it is believed that Brahma, who is the god of creation, created people in four categories. One came from his head, the Brahmins, who are considered to be the intellectuals, and next came uh, from the arms, the Kshatriyas, who are the warriors. Vaishyas, uh, they are the traders, they came from the thighs. And finally, the Shudras, who are considered to be uh, created for performing menial jobs, came from Brahma's feet. Now, aside from these four categories, it is also considered that there is another category below even Shudras called the untouchables. Now, untouchability as a practice, although is a human right violation, is practiced even today in India. And with, with this as the landscape, it would be better if we keep this in mind whenever for the rest of our conversation, because everything that Gita and I would be talking about today has got something or the other to do with this caste and the segregation that we have just mentioned. And Manushmati slash Hinduism slash caste system plays a huge role um, in understanding uh, Indian women's sex-based rights. That's great. and. <laughs> It is indeed huge, and it's of course been outlawed. I mean, Indian law 
is not supposed to be Manusmriti law at the moment, but it is still considered a sacred text. It's still, there's a, a sculptor who put it up outside the Rajasthan High Court. Uh, India is supposed to be a secular country, it, it, uh, so, sorry, a sculpture of the man. I mean, an imagined sculpture, because nobody knows uh, an, an imagined, uh, uh, I mean, imagined likeness of the man. Nobody knows what he looked like, um, or if indeed it was one person uh, who actually wrote this. Um, but uh, uh, India is supposed to be a secular country by its constitution, which, which uh, I think I will talk about a little more later. And uh, caste discrimination has been outlawed, but it's very much a fact of life. But I think the other issue that I want you to all to take into account is that, of course, it's intimately therefore wound up, wound up with patriarchy and, and how patriarchy is experienced in India. Um, but some of the issues that we, we are seeing around uh, caste violence is not connected with an unchanging India, but precisely because India is changing, because people are fighting, women are fighting and organized, and there's a huge backlash against it. So it's all those contexts. And in fact, some of those things are, are what are being dealt with in the film in terms of the individual struggles of women at the workplace, um, sometimes in the context of having trade union backing and sometimes uh, just simply as individuals uh, themselves. So right at the beginning, again, just after the Manusmriti quote, you mention uh, the name of a woman called Bhanwari Devi. And, uh, but you don't tell us very much about her. Uh, so could you sort of give us some background of who Bhanwari Devi was and what her struggle was and what it led to? Um, Bhavani Devi is why we have the 2013 legislation uh, that is uh, uh, supposed to provide redressal for working women in India. Uh, Bhavani Devi was employed by the Rajasthan state government's uh, women development program in uh, 1985. Um, her job basically was uh, to fight against the rampant child marriage system uh, that was followed in the state. Uh, not only by creating awareness, but also reporting such incidents to the authorities. So one such day when she was on the job as a working woman, um, she was, she's also involved in, uh, she was also involved in this door-to-door -door campaigns where she would counsel women on hygiene, family planning, education, and things like that. One, on, on one such occasion, uh, in 1992, she became aware of an impending marriage of a nine-month-old baby. Now, obviously, this baby belonged to a family that is upper caste, upper class. Um, as a child bride herself, um, she was married when she was in the age of six. Um, at, because she feels so strongly about it, she really wanted to put an end to the uh, charade that's going on that she found out about, even though the family that is um, going to perform it belonged to an upper caste. Now, because I sort of gave you a primer of the caste system in India, and I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with it in general, um, it, is, it is particularly of interest to us over here because Bhavani Devi does not belong to the upper caste. Um, she belongs to a lower caste, a Dalit woman. It, she really had some courage to speak up against this upper caste family. She was just doing her job there. But because obviously the upper caste men uh, had to teach her a lesson, um, five men gang raped her for daring to intervene or let's just say doing her job um, in broad daylight. Uh, her, her husband was beaten up. Um, you know, she was uh, gang raped by these five men um, and she was obviously crestfallen. What she did not do is, you know, just go back home and quit her job and stay at home for the rest of her life. What she did was something so pioneering. And I think, uh, um, I think I take courage for all the things that I do from the women like Bhavri Devi, because despite such a hardship and pushback and such a grotesque act being done on them directly, their spirit to condemn uh, these evils against women and children did not die out. Their spirit, if anything, got further enraged. And I think personally, I take 
my inspiration from women like her. So she went ahead and reported this uh, with the state department, uh, state government of Rajasthan, um, but and her organization, of course. But because the case involves uh, people with clout, men belonging to the upper caste, um, they did not really support her in any manner. But a group of women activists and everybody together wanted to question this regardless. So they fought tooth and nail against the state, um, the court uh, in the Rajasthan state. Um, they were, they were the, the five men were uh, persecuted, they were in jail, but in 1995, uh, during this course of time, in 1992, this happened during 1995, um, by that time, four judges had you know, changed uh, the people that are supposed to give the verdict as to this being a crime and the people below, um, responsible for it to be put in jail and things like that. Four judges had changed by then, all of them, mind you, upper caste men. So by 1995, uh, these men were acquitted. And the reason uh, why the judge thought that this was a non-issue is because these were, the, these were the reasons. They claimed that the village head will not rape. They claim that men of different castes cannot participate in gang rape. Older men, 60, 70 year olds, cannot commit rape. A man cannot rape in front of a relative. In, in, her, in Bhavri Devi's case, uh, the family that she contested against, two members from that family were, were involved in the gang rape. So the court's, judge, the court's uh, justification that was that two men were belonging to the same family. That can't happen. Two men might be involved in gang rapes that, uh, uh, you know, that won't, uh, can't be involved in a gang rape of a woman. Therefore, this is a non-issue. And finally, a member of a higher caste will not rape a woman from a lower caste, uh, caste because uh, for reasons of purity. So these men were acquitted, um, but her struggle did not stop. Uh, and it was in 2013 um, sorry, back then we, we had a guideline, which, which is called the Gishaka guideline, based on which we had the 2013 legislation, which was then considered to be the, the uh, you know, the umbrella act that, supposed, that is supposed to provide redressal for every working woman um, who uh, is experiencing sexual harassment at workplace. So that's a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, uh, background uh, for Bhamri Devi's case. Yeah, so that's, that meant that actually the guidelines that arose from her case arose that although she lost in the high court, as you described, with these horrific, um, very stereotypical, caste-ridden judgment of the court about uh, you know, these men who raped her, how they couldn't possibly have done it, when the rape by upper caste men of Dalit, Dalit being the most oppressed, the lowest, the so-called outcasts, as they were known, and now known as that. It's for those who aren't familiar with, uh, with the nomenclature and the system. So she's, she's a Dalit woman. She's from that background, which is considered outcast. And therefore, the pure will not rape the impure, went the argument of the court. However, it went to the Supreme Court, which produced the guidelines. So her, her defeat was turned, in a way, into a victory of Bhanwari Devi herself and the whole feminist movement in India because these were the first guidelines on sexual harassment in the workplace anywhere in the world. And that happened, um, what, in the early 2000s? I mean, it happened a very long time ago because her case was in the mid 90s. The Vishaka guidelines as they're known, I'll write them in the chat uh, uh, in a bit. Uh, went into, uh, you know, became the guidelines and later became the basis of the law, which was passed in 2013, uh, which is what your film is based on, isn't it? The film is an analysis of what sexual harassment is, how women experience it, what people think about it, and what, it, what, what stereotypes they have in their heads about, hence the title, which we can understand. Um, uh, but also about the process, the legal processes uh, connected with it. And how did you make the decision to go into that? Were you inspired by the Me Too movement? Um, what, what was your inspiration and how did you make the choices to choose the characters? The film took me about three years to make, uh, you know, from the time the idea came to mind and that I decided that I am going to fall into this bottomless pit 
uh, from uh, that to the time I completed the film and uh, held a premiere show uh, in Chennai. It took me three years. Um, my film predates Me Too by years um, because I started research early, early 2016. Um, and when the film uh, premiered in Chennai for the first time, November 2018, is when Me Too had sort of emerged as a, as a, as a moment in history of women's rights in India. What is interesting is the way media portrayed the film to be so prescient and timely and um, couldn't have come at a better time and things like that. But I often chuckle at it because not only was I planning to release it along, you know, the, the sort of uh, avalanche that Me Too was creating, I wasn't intending on releasing it to ride that tide. But it just so happened that, you know, the film came around the same time. But um, the decision to make the film, uh, the hard work and the women that spoke to me during the process of the film predates Me Too. Um, Me Too somehow gave a lot of women the courage to speak up about it anonymously, uh, non-anonymously and things like that. But back when I was researching, it was extremely difficult for me to convince these women to trust me and to speak in the film because their stories are very, very important. So the choice of my, uh, of my women uh, in the film sort of has uh, a lot of very rational thought behind it because I wanted to make sure, one, nobody will be anonymous in my film. If you see, all these women and some men will be looking directly into the camera and talking to you uh, as the audience. The reason that <laughs> I, I decided on that is because I was just really sick of people giving excuses that, well, why don't women come up uh, and talk about it? Why don't women speak up more about their harassment? If, if they're facing harassment so much, why are there not many complaints and things like that? So even though I spoke to hundreds and hundreds of women, I decided that I will keep the women that are only interested in not covering themselves, their identity in the film. So that was the first decision that I had to make, a painful decision, which means that even though there were some very, very shocking, um, scary stories, I couldn't include them in the film because they were, you know, uh, they, were, they were worried that they might lose their job, they might, they might uh, get more um, harassment from the, from the perpetrator if, if she speaks up about it and things like that. So that was that. And the reason why these women have spoken as a representative of a certain demographic and what those demographics are, uh, the reasoning behind that is I wanted to make sure that when I say working women, I did not want to restrict it to an educated, urban dwelling, air conditioned office, accessible um, sort of a workplace uh, you know, a, a, work, a, a working woman who has access to uh, air conditioned office. Although if I look around, that's what I will find over here because I live in a city, I belong, in, I belong to that class and it would make sense to just make a film about that too because that's, those stories are legit. But what I decided was, it was supposed to be a, a 30 minute, uh, you know, a debrief on what the act is and who, who is considered to be a working woman and things like that. But when I started researching over and over, I realized that I had taken on so much more than I can handle. And that's when I thought that, okay, this, this is something that we need to sort of sit down and break it down to the very, very bottom of the pyramid, unless, uh, I mean, uh, otherwise uh, I just... I just shouldn't be making this film at all. It, 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 it must either be about all of us or it, there shouldn't be a film on this topic. And given that this is the only film made um, on this subject um, in, in such uh, duration and length, um, I decided that I was responsible to make sure that I represent these women um, fairly um, so that people, when they watch it, they don't just think that this is Indian women or that this is India's working uh, workforce, female workforce, that shouldn't be the case. So I interviewed women belonging to, uh, based on their religion, region, caste, type of industry, um, you know, organized, unorganized, and then within unorganized, all the other uh, subsections like agricultural laborers, manual scavengers, construction laborers, garment factory workers, domestic workers, um, 
freelancers, filmmakers, writers, and things like that. Uh, women, especially coming from Northeast India to the mainland and the implicit bias they face and things like that. So I, I laid it out in front of me. I wanted that these are the kind of, uh, I, I, I hope that, uh, you know, back then that I have truly covered the various demographic that I believed would encompass working women in India. And then I started finding out women to fit those demographic who are also willing to talk about it, who are also courageous and who had a story to tell. So that's how I approached it. I had to make sure that I do not miss out on any demographic. One, because it would, it would prick my conscience. And two, because if I say working women, I'd rather represent all of us. And another thing that I had to decide while I was uh, making the film was to make sure that I did not sort of, uh, you know, take a segue into, you know, their work life or what is it that uh, uh, an Indian work, working woman looks like, you know, that sort of a thing. I didn't want to go with her to her air conditioned office and show that she's a CEO with her laptop and a cubicle and things like that. I could show that. But how would I show the working place of a woman who picks shit from the side of the road? So in order to counter that, and I thought I felt like a voyeur and I thought it was wrong. And while, while I'm filming, will I stop her from doing it or will I continue to film, uh, you know, selling my soul doing that? So I decided that there will not be any um, relief in the film. This is going to be a painful watch. I wanted people to um, make sure that they were experiencing uh, these women's trauma. So I made sure that there was no, you know how in documentaries you have this flowery nature scene, you ch show Chennai landscape and Mumbai landscape and film industry and things like that. I completely eliminated all of that. And that was a very, very hard decision to make. And I'll tell you, I think you'd understand, Geeta, my film did so poorly in film festivals because this is not a film festival worthy material. You know, this is a talking head who, who wants to sit down and listen to morbid uh, subject matter where women continuously just talk and talk and talk for two hours. So nobody wanted to do that. So that, that, um, that was, uh, you know, the basis with which uh, it all started. And now, after having completed the film, I have shown the film to a lot of uh, places, uh, in a lot of places within Chennai, in different parts of India, and to some extent in different parts of the world as well. I would say um, my film still does not do justice because um, even though I have made sure that I have included women's voices from you know, various marginalized communities, I have not been able to make it accessible to those women in the marginalized communities because a majority of the film is spoken in English or in certain, you know, vernacular languages. A woman from, say, um, Bihar can understand portions where the people are speaking in Hindi. But if you take somebody from Chennai, she can understand a word of what the person is speaking in Tamil or in Hindi. Um, so, in a way, that's a huge impediment. Although the film's done some good things like changed minds of uh, very, very obnoxious uh, male CEOs who have come to me later on said that they have initiated uh, setting up a committee in their workplace and things like that. And some women who felt like there was a huge load off their chest watching this film because until that time they were thinking that it was their fault. All those things aside, I believe that the film should actually reach its masses for whom I have actually made it. And that would only be possible if I made it in vernacular languages, get it dubbed and, you know, get it subtitled to an extent because most of the people can't read too, right? So I, I, all these efforts is also to make sure that the film, even, even in parts, it becomes accessible to women in rural areas, women at the bottom of the pyramid so that they can watch and they can get educated. That is, even though it is toothless, that there is some law in place that 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 these women must be part of the statistic when we're talking about working women. I think that's really important. And I think uh, for me, it's a really compelling watch. So I really advise anybody who hasn't watched it. In fact, I've watched it twice now and I can certainly watch it again because you see different things in the film when you watch it the first time. The first time you're trying to understand the arc of the film, talk, you know, the, the, a lot of the first part just talks about women talking about sexual harassment. And I think uh, our audience will find really that, uh, and I, I'm sure your audience, you, you've had audiences in various parts of the world, 
would find that this it's very universal. You know, the title is a universal title, but what was she wearing? I mean, any country anywhere in the world will know this comes up again and again with harassment, with rape, with abuse on, you know, whatever, whether it's at the workplace or on the street or in the, you know, pub or nightclub or anywhere. Um, you know, this, this is an issue that comes up. So um, that was one of the things I found refreshing about the film because uh, living in England, I mean, I've been involved as an activist in the feminist movement, and we'll talk about that later, perhaps, but in, in India, that's how I started. My feminism um, was born in India, as it were, and in a very fortunate time for the movement when women were really mobilizing and organizing and coming out on the streets. And I think in our arrogance, we thought maybe this was the first time people were doing it. And then I began to look at the history of it and I had family involved with the history of it. But of course, when you're young, you know, you think you've invented it for the first time. So I found that actually a lot of women had done extraordinary things um, before. Um, but I think for me as a filmmaker, it's a very watchable film because I think there's a value in the film that is in technical terms called just a talking head that is just just interviews where people are talking to camera because there is an intimacy there and there's a directness there. And I found that your, the range was really impressive because usually when we're making friends films in India, uh, most of the time, I mean, not uh, there are thousands of films made, obviously independent films as well as commercial films, but even the documentaries, most of the documentaries will tend to be on a specific area because I mean, the area is the size of a European state or larger than many European states, whichever, you know, like uh, your state of Tamil Nadu. Um, uh, how, what's the population roughly? Oh, no idea. I don't, well, no India is over a billion, but in any one state, you know, uh, you know, one of the big states in the north, 200 million, 250 million, you know, I mean, <laughs> the size is huge. So the smaller states, you know, 10 million or something like that. So we're talking about very large uh, structures, states, and most films, documentaries maybe about, uh, on issues would be about that particular area. So for me, it was actually wonderful uh, because I have the privilege of speaking English and Hindi, so two of the languages, other people would speak Malayalam and English, or you know, if you have English and you have one other language, you have the, the, the pleasure of understanding at least two languages in their original form. And then you, and the way people switch in and out of those languages, you know, uh, but you got, I don't know, four or five Indian languages in, uh, at least three. Yeah, um, Tamil, Hindi and Malayalam for sure. Yeah. Uh, but then, you know, we had an Arunachali girl speak a little bit of her local language, but uh, you know how in editing, we had to make certain decisions and certain parts of it were cut off. But uh, there was, there is definitely a lot of Hindi, Tamil and uh, Malayalam. In the film. Malayalam, yeah, that's what I picked up. And, and I mean, that's really unusual. I don't remember it in another doc, you know, I, off the top of my head, I can't think of, of another documentary that ranges over that. So it was, you know, for me, that was refreshing to watch. And it's, in, you know, the audience who, it comes from outside won't necessarily know which language people are speaking when it's not English. But it's important to be aware of that because this is a huge range. It's as if, you know, somebody's talking Swedish one minute and English the next and then Portuguese and Spanish, you know, uh, or, or Portuguese and Italian uh, uh, at, at, at different points in the film. And that that's the range. Um, but you also have this in a way, somewhat unfashionable idea that women are women and just women, I mean, as a sex class and not so fundamentally divided that those divisions stop us from seeing some of these issues as also as common issues, while not avoiding the fact that they do come from these different backgrounds. They specifically refer to the issue of being from that background and being harassed for the stereotypes associated with the background that they come from yeah mm. yeah um and the convenience of having them speak in their local language was just was also that uh, it it came directly from their heart uh, in fact i was encouraging pretty much everybody to speak in their native tongue even though they were fully capable of speaking in english uh, but they just chose the language of their convenience some of them um you know how it is. These are normal people. These are not actors. These are regular people. And they thought somehow if you're making a 
firm it's 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 an obligation to continue to speak in english for some reason in many cases i had to really take a break and said if you're not going to continue in hindi we are not filming it you know things like that so it was exciting for me to also listen to their um the courage and the conviction with which they were pursuing the case if they were pursuing it at that time also there is some sort of an honesty uh, about um being a woman in india and speaking in your native tongue mm -hmm. and i thought these women brought in that honesty to the film by speaking in a vernacular language and i personally take it as a as a as a matter of pride i wish more people had spoken in regional language but i think i personally take it as a matter of pride that i don't want to please an english speaking audience at all mm -hmm. if you can't understand it make an effort read the subtitle but that's not my problem my women will speak in the language that they are con comfortable speaking in you know so i was very very clear from the get go that this you know how i i've noticed that in film making in the film making world in the or otherwise there is a there is a destination you know khan uh, mm -hmm. sundance or you know um, some in prestigious iffk iffi and things like that i made the film to be a slap in the face for uh, the lawmakers and uh, you know the criminal justice system so i did not have to worry about uh, reach and you know the uh, how 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 well made my film was in terms of production quality or although i i know that the production quality of my film is fabulous but there are things that would count as a film festival type film and mine is not one of them and it didn't deter me initially it was hard because i would think that a feminist film festival that is exclusively focusing on human rights or labor rights would pick my film but it wouldn't because it might just be too long anyway that's that's a side but i was it was my pleasure to make sure that uh, i involved uh, women across the board and have their stories be told in a way that they were not feeling bad they were not seeking pity they were not even there to um call out the apathy they were there to speak things as they were they were not uh, mincing words when they were saying rape or sexual violence or male violence they were not trying to sugarcoat it these women were just raw um, and i and i think that is also one of the most important thing about a film like that because if if we are talking about male violence against women we'd rather not be mincing words is what i would uh, think and just this uh, aspect i don't know if you be coming to that geeta about the you know the uh, the organized and the unorganized sectors that's also something that i want to talk may i talk a little bit about that as well let me ask you about the statistics because that you can talk about that in that question yes. i think it will relate to that so you did some research and the people you were working with i know you wanted to clarify with me what you did and what you know the organizations you interviewed and so on were doing so you you uh, or they uh, organizations who were working with use the right to information act which is again an act one out of a great deal of struggle including of organized women uh, women uh, agricultural and um, uh, mainly agricultural workers um, but uh, uh, you looked for statistics on harassment at work so what did you find what happened so the national crime report bureau is our go to place for getting information about the crime statistics in india ncrb data as we call it now most of what we uh, what what gets registered in the ncrb data or data that either has a court case pending or has a first information report on it or things like that so um an annual sweep of uh, statistics sort of gets registered into the ncrb and uh, people can access it directly via their website but there are things that are not very clear uh, about the ncrb data again the trouble with uh, getting information from the ncrb also is the fact that it will only be considered a statistic if there is some sort of an fir on it Uh, so what I about the first information report meaning that yes. somebody has lodged a report in the police station yes about only, 
that they allege is a crime. They, they've made a report saying a crime has been committed against me. Correct. Those are their sources and that's how they they build their statistic. Now that grossly um, completely eliminates a huge number of uh, people um, for, for whatever reason, like fear or um, how the, um, I mean, um, let's say so this this practice of uh, pulling data from say first information report the problem with that is it we won't it won't include women who don't have access to or have been turned away by and are entirely unfamiliar with the criminal justice system the laws in place or what their fundamental rights are and things like that so if i go to say i don't know chidambaram or sirgari somewhere a rural town in tamil nadu and go to a woman and ask her hey do you know that there is a law right now you can uh, file a complaint against your landowner because he is abusing you while you're farming uh, his land um, what do you think about that that's stupid and that's arrogant to think that you know these the, these women are also part of this ncrb data no they are not because they do not know that there is such a um, redressal practice in place so how can you then claim that an ncrb data uh, truly represents the crime situation of a country and, and a country like the size of like uh, a country like india which has, which has a population that we are all very familiar with uh, so there were also these privately funded uh, researches that were uh, conducted, Gita, and um, I shared this information with a bunch of data scientists and I asked them uh, the quality of this finding or, or, the, or the sample size that they have taken and things like that. Again, is limited to urban cities and you know educated people who know how to fill those questionnaires and um, especially people that are working in the organized sector. What I learned is that, this was not part of the NCRB though, what I learned is that um, the economic survey that was released in 2019, the unorganized sector amounts to 93% of the total workforce of the country, men and women. Um, and the labor organization says that globally, 50% of the population are women, 30% of the labor force are women. Women perform 60% of all the working hours. They receive 10% of the world's income and own less than 1% of the world's property. While we have this on the one hand, and then you tell me that the NCRB data is the one that I need to, you know, believe to be true and make sure that I align my film and my research according to that statistic. I decided to entirely um, not rely on it at all. Mm -hmm. So what I did, I had to build a statistic ground up based on the women that I was interviewing. Um, now, obviously, there were RTI's uh, right to information petition the, the, that were filed. Now, see, uh, the thing with this law is any, any organization that has at least 10 members, a minimum of 10 members, must have something called the Internal Complaints Committee, uh, where you, know, you can go when you face sexual harassment and they will look into it and they'll provide a result and so on and so forth. That, that seems pretty straightforward. But what about women that are not part of a structural organizational setup, women belonging to the unorganized sector. Even me, I work as an individual. I produce, direct, write, edit, shoot everything by myself. When I'm out on the road with a camera and somebody groups me, what, what, I'm a working woman. That's my workplace. What do I do? I don't have an internal complaints committee. So to, to avert that crisis, the 2013 Act made sure that there is a local complaints committee in every district. Lo and behold, the uh, right to pe information petitions that we filed with the help of these organizations, the district collector is supposed to be on top of these things. The district collector had no idea that he's supposed to set this up. Right. Yeah. So basically what they're saying is this you know, this Akka that sells garland down at Pondi Bazaar near the temple town outside it, outside the, you know, this big temple. Um, somebody who's a freelance writer, somebody who's a filmmaker like me. If we are sexually harassed 
and we go to the district collector because he's the one supposed to set up a local complaints committee. The district collector is the, the, the sort of um, local level, but very powerful government official. Yes. So he's, he's a member of the state government, the, the national bureaucracy. Yes. And uh, so he or she, uh, it's in their hands that they, they're supposed to. They're, they're also sort of the first judicial authority in a way. Correct. So yeah. these RTIs, when they were filed, we got a response saying um, they had no information. The, the RTI um, you know, department had no information about the names of the personnel um, that are part of this local complaints committee, their email address, their phone numbers. None of this was available. So as morbid as a, a, a life of a woman in India, a working woman in India, um, uh, as morbid as it is, we, the law basically says that we can't seek redress anywhere either because the district collector was completely taken aback when uh, we had written to them asking him, what's the deal? Where, 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 where is the information? Now, of course, as with every uh, issue pertaining to women exclusively, uh, it's, I, have, I have learned that it has never taken any precedence, right? So it has never been important enough for somebody to sort of collectively look into it, make it a priority and things like that. Uh, about four or five years ago, um, I ran a campaign and I spoke to the drug control director of the state of Tamil Nadu because emergency contraceptive pills were not available over the counter. Um, even though it's a schedulized drug and it's, it can, it's legal to sell it over the counter, they were being prejudiced because they were quoting moral reasons as to why women shouldn't have emergency, access to emergency contraceptive pills. Now, I got the ban lifted. I spoke to the drug control director of the state. I got the ban lifted and I had him make a recommendation to the center that any other state that is of a similar moral hangup must also lift the ban. Now, once it went to the center, it became uh, part of a fortress and I had no access to it afterwards. But even today, um, emergency contraceptive pills are not available, even though the ban has been lifted. Now, the, what I'm trying to say here is when I was talking to the drug control director about what an emergency contraceptive pill is, uh, why it is important for every woman, especially women belonging to, uh, you know, the marginalized communities, women, poor women that are, you know, on the streets who get raped and children, minors and things like that. When I'm trying to explain that to him, I was growing more and more embarrassed because it was as if he was not, he was thinking I was speaking Mandarin or something. Mm -hmm. That is how important officials believe women's issues to be. Yeah. So, I mean, it's no joke. It took us nearly 20 years to get this act passed. Um, I can only believe uh, these women when they say it was a struggle. I believe them because in this light, tiny little adventure that I had with the State Department's drug control director, I, it, it opened my eyes. So now when they say the NCRB data is the data to go by, I was just not going to have it. So I, I made these women speak about their issues and my data or my statistic was the fact that there were no data. So that was a finding in itself that NCRB, whatever it provides, it's skewed, it's limited, it, is, it can't be extrapolated to the country as a whole. So while the organizations helped me file all these, I mean, uh, um, these organizations filed all these RTIs, um, I was able to take the information from them saying that they were unaware of it and things like that. And I made it an issue in the film. No data is data. So yeah, absolutely. That, is, that is what no I data always tells the story. And I, I mean, I'm interested the, this issue of embarrassment. You're talking about the embarrassment of the bureaucrat. The issue of embarrassment is there right through all sorts of organizations. So when I joined Amnesty International, I was head of the gender unit and we were about to embark on uh, a, a massive campaign, a global campaign on stopping violence against women. And Amnesty had a terrible record on ever reporting on any kind of violence against women. They'd done a little bit of campaigning uh, in, in a couple of campaigns before, but I joined in 2002, at the end of 2002, during the 1990s when the genocides in Rwanda and uh, former Yugoslavia and Bosnia and so on were going on. Uh, they were not reporting on mass rape of women. They were not calling them a genocide, but quite apart from not labeling them as genocide, they were not reporting 
the rape. Uh, way back in 71, I mean, they definitely didn't see it when it was happening in Bangladesh. The only issue they reported on really was the mass, the, the, when this, the Pakistani soldiers had been held and they were held under Geneva Convention conditions. They were not put in Guantanamo Bay kind conditions. Uh, by the by, the Indian Army, and they were in fact later returned. So you know, whatever campaign there was was of short duration. But that was Amnesty's concern: was the treatment of uh, the perpetrators of mass rape. I mean, the fair treatment uh, under uh, in captivity of the perpetrators of mass rape and the, and, and genocide uh, of the population. Um, but when I talk to the researchers, you know, there's a whole, there's a, there's a lot of writing about stigma and silence and so on. And of course it's there. And it's true that there are times when women don't disclose, they don't disclose for years. Um, sometimes only when their children are grown up, maybe they become campaigners 10, 20 years later and so on. And this particularly happened in the case of the so-called Tokyo comfort women and so on. But I found talking to the researchers that they were saying things to me like they had dis had had women disclosing to them, but they didn't know what to do with those disclosures, so they put them away. I mean, they did not include them in their reports. Women who had come out and actually trusted an amnesty researcher with that disclosure, they didn't put them. Remind me again, who are the people who complain that women don't speak up enough? <laughs> the research we, organizations like Amnesty, you know, they write pages on stigma and discrimination. Stigma is within the mind of the researcher quite as much as it's in the mind of the woman for completely different reasons. Just embarrassment like this, you know. Don't tell me about it. I don't know what to do. And, uh, and uh, I mean, they didn't necessarily disbelieve. And then later when they were reporting, sometimes women would talk in the third person. And I would get a report on my desk and say, this is all in the third, but this is just hearsay, we can't report. I said, do you realize that somebody may be talking to you and she'll be talking in the third person because she cannot say, this happened to me. You know, you have to be able to, you know, think about, you know, is this just some tenth, you know, some rumor that went around or is this somebody talking about themselves in the third person yeah, because okay. it's safer, you know? Uh, for them to do that. Uh, so the whole series. There's a complete, uh, there's a complete elimination of uh, victims uh, of sexual harassment in general. And because, uh, you know, like in India, we follow the adversarial model of common laws country. Uh, we, we, we made, we've made the act, uh, laws in such a way that the moment uh, a woman makes a complaint and her court uh, and her case is in the court, um, she is removed from the case. So it becomes a state versus the perpetrator yeah. uh, as opposed to the victim versus the perpetrator. So the moment you remove her, her problems, her crisis, her situation, her taboo and how she fits back into the society is completely um, eliminated. Um, completely. Um, what happens is you're right. You know, when, whenever we talk about uh, uh, you know, life imprisonment and uh, all this hanging and all of that, we are always focused on um, human rights of the perpetrator. Should we really hang him? Is, is capital punishment really the solution? You know, that's mostly uh, been the worry of uh, people over here as well, but not really what happens to the woman. No, she is the one that was raped although she shouldn't be the one that should face the stigma and the shame, she is. She is the one that is exclusively bearing the weight, the burden of Indian patriarchy, the, her and the family. And most of the cases we know where the women just couldn't have uh, take it anymore and they've killed themselves. So while, the, okay, while it is true that we should think about whether capital punishment is needed or not, the truth remains that even if there is capital punishment or the prospect of capital punishment, it is not deterring men from committing such crimes. So there have been cases where uh, a rape victim uh, was persecuted and was out on bail and the man came right back to the family and killed the girl. How dare she makes a complaint? You know, if, if that is the state of the law, um, you know, that we have in place, you can't really talk about uh, how a woman can be openly uh, sharing her grief or her 
case, uh, her experience uh, that happened in a workplace or anywhere else for that matter, of course she will talk in third person. Mm. There is no other, there, she does not have a choice. Yes, and what's remarkable, as your film shows, the women are willing to talk. I mean, and they are willing to demonstrate, in fact, and, and mobilize on this. So some of the, I mean, Bhanwari Devi was what brought the sexual harassment issue up to the Supreme Court and got these guidelines. And that was from the 90s. But I remember a very key case of the women's movement, uh, which was actually happened when I was still in my teens, Mathura, the Mathura rape case, which was an Adivasi girl. That's a, uh, mm. a girl, again, from a very poor, marginalized tribal background. This was a girl. She was a young girl. And she actually went to the police station to make a complaint and the police raped her. And in India, there's emerged as a ba uh, on the basis of a lot of these different um, uh, cases like this of rape in police stations, the concept of custodial rape. And I don't know if other countries have laws on it. So India has a vast amount of good laws as a result of these campaigns, uh, which take these situations into account. So custodial rape is um, supposed to be particularly bad because it's obviously somebody in authority raping somebody who has absolutely no control. You know, it's, uh, uh, and, and, and it was put into the law, you know, particularly to hold authorities to account. Now, again, in the Mathura case, it became a national issue. Uh, she lost in the, the magistrate's court or something, said she couldn't, you know, she must have uh, brought this on herself and she obviously wasn't a virgin or some, something. It went to the high court as a result of an opening of the case by human rights lawyers, uh, feminists, and uh, men also wrote, male uh, sort of uh, human rights, uh, civil rights lawyers. Uh, wrote an open letter, reopened the case. The high court, she won. It went to the Supreme Court and they were quitted again. So and basically in India, the measure of success is if, if you get somebody in jail for five minutes or two years or three years, even if they get acquitted in the end, that's something, you know, there's been some. Uh, but the case became a national mobilizing thing. And the earliest uh, anti-rape demonstrations was somewhere around 79, 80, 81, I, I can't remember exactly. And I remember trying to go, uh, I was working in a, in a sort of semi-rural area that a lot of very, very, I mean, the sort of Delhi ruling classes had colonized. I mean, they built farmhouses in those areas. I think there were tax breaks on them or something. So they built large houses, which were called farmhouses, basically. But they had, of course, agricultural labor working on them. So we were trying to unionize that uh, labor. This is just after the emergency has appeared uh, when India's civil liberties had totally been cut, uh, you know, absolutely axed, but then there'd been a democratic government elected and people had come out of jail. Uh, a lot of people from communist parties, Maoist, Marxist, Leninists, and so on, who'd felt that we have to take part in the democratic process and do all these things that they'd previously despised, like work in unions or set up organizations and mobilize around uh, things like wages and rations, ration cards, and things like this. So anyway, I was involved with one of those, and we were working with the Dalit community on their land rights, as well as wage issues in other areas. And so actually my first battle was to say to my elders, I was one of the youngest people there, I was, you know, 20 odd, um, uh, you know, that uh, the women aren't coming to these meetings. And, uh, you know, some of the older women came because older women have more ability to mix and sit with men and sometimes tell the men off and so on. I said, but, you know, we're discussing this issue which is relevant to all of them and actually the women are not hearing. They're just sort of sitting in the huts with their children and we're in a hall somewhere and they're not with us in the hall. So after, you know, much back and forth, I got the, I they agreed that we'll hold separate meetings for the women. We're not discussing women's issues, mind you, but we were at least informing them of the general issue of the land that, you know, we'd gone to see the government or written a petition or what was going on and that they could participate that way because they weren't coming into the general meeting, the other meeting, which was basically a men's meeting. Um, but then I said, okay, there's this rape demonstration happening, anti-rape demonstration. What should we do? I, and they said, you can't talk about rape. They don't know what rape is. <laughs> they won't know. And of course, this was the embarrassment of middle-class activists, you know, that they didn't want to raise this issue. Yeah. So I went off with, um, 
actually a young man who was, so uh, again, one of the younger people who was, uh, you know, part of the team. And we thought, okay, we're just going to do this. So off we went and we sat down actually first with the older men and women and started talking about it with them very haltingly. And of course they knew exactly what rape was because rape is not just an issue between the sexes, but it's a caste and a class issue. It's absolutely a caste and a class issue. And they absolutely understood it immediately. I mean, we didn't raise marital rape in that thing. So we were not talking about relationships within the family, which would have been very hard to raise at that particular moment. But even generally raising it, they talked about it. And I remembered from staying in the village, you know, that the women have to get up. And that's the thing they talked about. That they have to get up at night to go to the loo. You know, they have to get up before the light. So they're out before the men go. So they sleep much less because they, they have much more domestic work on top of all their other work, their agricultural work. They have the domestic work and they sleep very late. And they have to get up very, very early because they have to piss and shit in the field before anybody else. And they're very vulnerable at that time. Yep, if yep, there's yep. anybody else out there. So they started talking about all these experiences and they were completely uh, unashamed about talking about it. You know, they, they were just telling us, this is what we face. And the men were actually very sympathetic because it's, it's their, in this case, it was their women yeah. that they were unable to protect, you know, yeah. enough. So in the end, about 40 women from the village went on that demonstration with a couple of male chaperones, but very supportive older male chaperones who'd come along, <laughs> they're marching along with the young feminists and so on. So, I mean, there's a very long history. That was, you know, back in around 1980. People think that, you know, sexual violence came with the Delhi rape case or Me Too, and even the younger generation of feminists in India don't know about all these, these struggles that happened uh, long before. And that, and uh, that Delhi demonstration was part of a uh, national mobilization about rape that was happening. There were demonstrations all over the country about it. So, you know, I just feel that the issue of silence, stigma, and all these things is often not vested in the communities or the women themselves, but in how we approach them and how they're dealt with, you know, it's, it's uh, both ways. But so apart, I mean, I want to now get back to the film and apart from the, uh, the interviews, as we've said, it's talking heads, but it is, um, it is, uh, it's got chapters as it were, and it's broken up. Uh, with and so uh, when you're watching it, uh, I, I believe the link lasts for some time, doesn't it? It lasts for about seventy-two hours after you start watching. Yeah, by yeah. link. Yeah. yeah. So if you haven't got much time, you know, all the audience, if you haven't got the time to watch it in one go, you can stop and you use the same link to uh, link into it over a couple of uh, three days. Uh, no, more than three days, seventy-two hours. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, is, is, and that's important because you feel I'm too rushed. I can't do it. You can do it. It's broken up into chapters. You can, you know, sort of watch it uh, in, in chunks. Um, and you have within uh, also breaking it up, you have da dance performances. So can you tell us what, what those are about? What, what was your inspiration and uh, what do they signify? I mean, they're very beautiful to watch, but apart from that, what do they yeah. signify? Thank you. Um, the uh, some of the quotes that I read out earlier uh, about uh, the quotes uh, available in Manusmriti about what Manu Manu thought about women, um, I put that together as a compilation and made it as a music video, and I called it the Jacquard Womb, because uh, Manu Manu said that if you don't align with his laws, you would be cursed in your afterlife, afterlife, reborn in the womb of a Jacquard. So I said, well, cool, let's do it. And I, and I, made, a, <laughs> I made a music video uh, and I called it the Jacquard's Womb, uh, where women are basically really just retaliating or saying um, that they will not fit in to these laws or these, they will not fit into these boxes and they, they've had enough of it. And these women burn the goddamn script in the end of the music video, so in the film as well. So while I made that as a music video, I uh, each performance would sort of uh, align with a particular quote that was in Manusmriti, but I didn't want to overwhelm it 
in the film. So I kept only the in uh, music, um, the dance part of it, and I thought in itself, as abstract as it may be, um, brings with it uh, an interesting uh, interpretation, if you will. So I wanted the audience to just you know. The common motive was just that black, uh, big red cloth, and I was very. It was very obvious that it would be like the patriarchy, uh, and there was this one motive where uh, a man and a woman are going around in circles. There was an implication of a, of a marriage where they go around the fire and things like that. And in that, if you notice, the man would have it uh, shackled on his feet, and the woman would have it around her womb. I wanted to imply that, and while she may choose to take it off it is important to realize that the man is still shackled by it. Patriarchy is evil to men too. And that's when, you know, the men in the film talk about the importance of breaking the bro code and uh, um, just moving away from the conversations that resort uh, to, you know, these locker room nonsense and things like that. So the performance in itself in isolation can be watched and enjoyed and maybe feel vicarious pleasure that these women are saying, you know, one up to uh, all these old scriptures. But in the film also, it sort of alludes you into the next chapter or the next few chapters of the film. That was, um, while, I, while I am aware that it is hard to sit down for two hours to watch women talk, I thought if I were to give it a break, I thought I would give it a break that is still sort of relevant to the subject matters that they were talking about. So I infused them um, wherever in these very, very strategic places so that you know, you get a moment's rest, but at the same time, you're still watching, interpreting, and then that sort of leads you on to the uh, next few talking heads, really. Yeah. So, I we've actually had some questions. Um, uh, there were some advanced questions as people were watching, so I'm going to start asking you some, uh, some of those. Um, so, I think there was a, well, a natural reaction, I think, saying, well, if the film is about the law, not, you know, it's about a law, but the law doesn't appear to be working for women. So could you say something about the gap between law and practice? And what are the, you know, what are the things that we should be suggesting instead? Um, these international complaints committees, they don't seem to be working. So what, what's your view on that? Um. If a 30 year old uh, long struggle to implement uh, an act hasn't succeeded in, you know, bridging the gap between, um, you know, uh, the practice, uh, the, the act and the final consumer of the act, I don't know what as an individual or as a filmmaker I can do or think differently that would make things better. What I'm trying to say is uh, a 30 year old struggle to implement an act has been a gross failure. So what can we do about it? I really don't know. Uh, but it feels rather defeatist to also sit down and say, well, there is now an act, but it doesn't work. What do we do? And I wonder if it is because that the gap is the implementation. The fault is in the implementation of it. That's why my film also ends in, uh, it's all right if you spent uh, decades and decades in fighting for some rights and uh, you finally achieve it. And they, do, they no longer want you to struggle about it. They don't, know, don't want you to speak about it because now they've given you the act. So what are you protesting for, right? The fact is not that there is an act. The fact is, whether such an act has been duly implemented with the good faith and the best interest of the victim in mind, in this case, all the working women, mostly the unorganized sector, because we know that they, they, they are part of the major workforce in India. So I don't have a solution to it other than, you know, uh, encourage more women in leadership positions young women speaking up about it, demanding, um, you know, that there should be some sort of a committee in place. I think the fundamental thing that we need to do in countries, developing countries, is educate women about the rights, about the law, about the history of women's rights in, in, in our country. Because 
what I've learned is once people watch the film, the kind of responses I'm getting is something that uh, is just so flabbergasting because to me, this is common sense. There is an act, it's useless. Women are still struggling. So what is the point of this act? So I project the film to somebody. And there are some people that are watching it for the first time. They have no idea such an act exists. They have no idea that uh, there should be an ICC. Their company does not have it. So they come to me and they tell me, um, all along I was thinking that what that man said to me was because I did not wear dupatta that day. Mm. Now I know better mm. to not blame myself. So, and these women are also feeling encouraged to speak up about it, speak against authority, question, challenge status quo. I think that would be the, you know, the beginning of uh, the implementation of uh, aspect of uh, the act. Because what the activists have done, the women have done, is they have given us this. Uh, many people spent their entire life fighting for one of these acts. They are probably not even alive to see such an act got implement, um, you know, passed in the first place. So I think most of the time I say, I don't know uh, to a question like this, but I think the little things that we can encourage uh, people to do is to start being familiar with the acts of your country, the, the rights that you have as a citizen, as a woman, and to keep demanding for our rightful space and to keep demanding for uh, safety at workplace. Um, find out what are the support groups that are available. Seek, uh, reach out to them. Find out what it is that they can do to help you if you are finding yourself in a position like this. You would obviously face a lot of resistance because everybody hates a woman that can speak up, stand up for her rights. So they will hate you even more if you want to make a scene, uh, you know, in an organization, make, where is the uh, internal complaints committee? If you ask, they would ask you, why, why were you, were you harassed? Were you, did some, somebody say something? Did somebody do something? Maybe it's something that you were, you know, it's a vicious cycle, but nobody really thinks that the success of any act is to make sure that there is no cases in the first place. So if you have an ICC and if you make everybody aware that such a policy exists, Maybe there won't be any cases at all if people are, you know, being dutiful citizens and men are not being pigs. Maybe then we will have uh, no cases and therefore we don't have to worry about this gap at all. But until that time, we need to keep demanding for our space, for our rights and for, for all these acts and everything. And just really partake in this you know, global movement, you know, I think it's, it must be every girl's prerogative from a very young age to understand that we live in an unequal society. As morbid and as, as disappointing as it may be to learn that we be born by chance of, uh, you know, by, by chance we're born and uh, it, hap it so happens that we're women and yet the world hands over um, this unequal world to us and now we've got to fight for it. But, you know, but that needs to be instilled in all of us because our collective voice is going to turn the tide. Uh, nothing else will. I, I got carried away there, but I hope. No, I, the, the thing is, that as a kind of old lag around these things, I mean, it, there is that gap. You know, there may be the, the gap between trying to use the act has been shorter with this act than in many other cases. You know, dowry laws were passed decades ago. And it's decades later, the anti-dowry laws, that somebody actually goes and tries to use the law. Because in between, we, we fought against dowry murders. I mean, I made a film about it. That was one of my earliest forms of activism, uh, was uh, you know, doing a, a street play about dowry uh, in the places where women had been killed. Uh, and, um, but, but also taking it up in terms of court cases and trying to get justice for these you know, murdered girls. It, usually it was their mother fighting. Uh, for yeah. them, uh, but with the guilt on her that the that the woman had come back to the home typically many times her natal home, and said I can't stand this anymore. And they'd maybe given her dinner or maybe kept her a few days or whatever. But they always sent her back. Yeah, have to go back. Uh, and another film I made was on uh, a woman who murdered her husband, but in the same situation. She was an uh, Indian origin woman living in Britain called Kiranjita Luwalia, and she. Uh, killed because her family fully expected that she would be killed 
because there'd been so many incidents of domestic violence and she'd run away so many times and the police had brought her back, quite apart from the family wanting to send her back to her husband. And they thought that she would be the martyr, you know, uh, figure, but instead she killed her husband and went to jail for it. And then we had to fight to get her out. And, but we did change the law and the law has helped people who have used it since then. And, and uh, there were several other women in the film. Uh, there were at least two other women who were white in the film. She was a, she was a sick woman, uh, Kiran, Kiranjeev. Uh, they all were released after court cases and after our campaigning, and it was a it was a joint campaign uh, between uh, Southall Black Sisters, Justice for Women, uh, you know Julie Bindle and uh, Harriet uh, Wistrich, and so on. So you know there were a number of different women's groups that got involved with that campaigning. And at the moment, I mean, after so many advances on training people around rape and so on, rape prosecutions are a total mess in this country. Total utter mess, yeah. you know? So it's like you feel you've gone back to the drawing board, but I would never recommend to people that they, you know, I'd say there's a conversation to be had about how much weight and emphasis and time you put in legal reform, but I would never say that it's not necessary. So, but at one point, I think in another interview, you said that you hadn't included some better examples in the film that you came across. So I wanted to ask you about that. Oh God, we all love a happy ending. And I did not want to give that to people. Um, is it a happy ending? You know, I had this conversation with a, a friend of mine. I saw a, a film on, uh, you know, a documentary on British television. I can't remember the name of it, unfortunately, but it was precisely about how bad the situation was for rape prosecutors. By the way, it's much worse now. This was some years ago this film came out. And, and how bad things were. And so my friends at Southall Black Sisters, which is a women's group in Britain that uh, I was part of for years, and um, uh, they, were, they, they said to me that they were absolutely distraught after this film was uh, released because so many women who'd put in complaints were saying we want to withdraw our complaint. And the point mm -hmm. is it never addressed the issue. What happens if a woman has feminist advocacy standing beside her? As you, as, of course, it's the same system as in India to the extent that the woman is just a witness in her own case. I mean, yeah. she's not treated in any special way. Um, but if she has good advocates who are looking after her outside the formal system, uh, if they've helped her find really good lawyers who really fight on her behalf, uh, you can't guarantee the outcome, but you can try and make it a better outcome. And certainly SBS has. I mean, they've challenged a Hindu priest. In fact, the woman involved challenged the priest because in the sense that she, she, well, SBS helped her get, they took pictures of her and so on. And he'd gone out of the country, but then the police did nothing about it. But then when he came back into the country, uh, they raised the case again. They went back and harassed the police into reopening the case and he was eventually convicted. So even in Britain, it's not a walk in the park uh, to, to earn victories over this. Uh, but I felt, you know, I had a argument with a very close friend of mine with whom I did a, a film on war crimes. And he said, it's not the job of journalists to provide, you know, a positive example. And I said, but you know, if it's there, I'm not saying invent it. I'm not, you know, I would never say don't underplay the difficulties. But I think the positive example also tells women that they can win, you know, because they've got both examples uh, about, and even in the film, I think a lot of women would take away that there were no victories. But I'd say that there were these mini victories, which often caused a backlash. Yeah. But, but, you know, in the situation of India, where in one of your cases, a manager had to apologize to a much more junior woman. And I don't, I don't, I forget her background. What, do you remember the background of the woman in the case? Yeah, um, it was spoken uh, by Suganti from All India Democratic Women's Association in an organization in the rural part of Tamil Nadu where she was working as a, as, as a, you know, on a, on a uh, compassionate basis, she had got this job when her husband passed and this manager found it in himself to, you know, be uh, a pain in the ass. And they found out about it and Idwa intervened. And the solution to that is not that they would, you know, take this up as a case and provide redress and things. They just immediately intervened and said that, you know, why don't you just apologize and let's just 
call it off and let's not make a big deal out of it. He apologized and she got transferred to someplace, he got transferred to someplace or whatever. But it was because he was asked to apologize to this girl who was perhaps of a lower caste and a lower um, a designation that it hurt his male ego that he thought that he should seek revenge. So these men, um, this is not an isolated case, obviously, uh, when you, when you, when you, when you ask a man why he is harassing you, they take it as an affront, affront, because why I'm a man, I'm, I'm entitled to harass you. So don't please, please allow me to harass you is what men like say, you know, I, I, that's what I feel when these people get offended when a woman raises an issue to safeguard herself, her body, her mind. So this man said that and uh, he then made her life miserable for the rest of the time she was in the organization and she finally decided she had had enough and she quit. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of, to just quickly go back to the uh, positive cases aspect of it, I think the positive about this film is that these women, um, uh, these women are the positive in my film. Um, you know, their fight and their struggle and their, Resilience is the positive of my film. The trouble is, Gita, you know, we saw that in one case where there is this woman with uh, all the cloud, all the money uh, next to a CEO having access to world-class lawyers and uh, everything. She was ridiculed by the judge, um, you know, saying things like, well, why are, you, why are you laughing and chatting? You don't look like somebody, you don't look like you were harassed by somebody. You don't look like a victim. You know, those are the kinds that, are, those are the kinds of comments that she gets to hear. And contrast that with a woman, a construction laborer, whose supervisor forced her, raped her in, uh, with the promise of marrying her later on, got her pregnant, and she has no recourse either. So, I, my intention was to say that it's not that if you have money, you can have a way with Indian uh, policies. It's not that if you are really poor, you cannot get away with it at all. In the case of the construction worker, they, they fought the case, but they sought redressal from the SEST Atrocity Act, but not the Women's Sexual Harassment Act. That's a point. To, we, so we so need the SESC is, uh, SDSC is scheduled tribes and scheduled castes. That's a technical term. In other words, the most marginalized groups, the outcast groups, the tribal groups and so on, who have protection under the law because of their, their oppressed position, because they're, they're a protected category uh, under, under uh, discrimination. Yeah. So, in that sense, she was not she was not provided a wrestle as a woman, as a working woman, and that it's a workplace sexual harassment case. But she was provided a wrestle because uh, the man said something along the lines of, "You're Dalit, I can't marry you." Mm -hmm. So, the, it's not to say that uh, you know marginalized women can never uh, win Indian judiciary, Indian judicial system practice, and somebody with a lot of money can. I wanted to just juxtapose that to make sure that we are clear that Indian policies, uh, or at least the implementation of it, is anti-women. Mm. You can be anybody within the spectrum, but when it comes to your sexual violence um, and when you seek redressal, you would be put in the same exact place. You will be held in the same exact place as a woman who's a who's a non-man, who's second to man, therefore a, a non-issue in itself. So that, that was my idea. But the fact that these women spoke so courageously, I think sort of uh, took care of the fact that there were some successful cases. I, how, how can we call a case successful anyway, Gita? You know, this woman would have practically pulled every hair out of her head by the end of it. How is that success? The man would come she, out and... But she wanted it. I mean, for instance, and it's interesting, actually, the CEO is one of the few where it's a lawyer, the male lawyer talking on her behalf. So it's the yes. most powerful woman of your interviewees who's not an interviewee. Yes. Who's not on camera, actually. Yes, yes exactly. Um, because at that time, she had to be anonymous because the case was still going on. Her case is still pending, by the way. There is only one recourse left, and that is the Supreme Court. Uh, the one... But the Supreme Court, at the, in, in the case hearing, the judge said something along the lines of, this woman is after the CEO's money, 
um, she is uh, going to be filed under defamation. That was the last what I heard from. Which the, is happening uh, here as well. I mean, one of my friends has been facing defamation. She's been fighting in three different countries because her child was snatched uh, in a Middle Eastern country uh, and her, uh, her husband, and she's British, her husband is French. But he was living there, so he took advantage of Sharia law there. He divorced her without her presence. He took the custody of the child. And so she's been fighting in that country and then in France and in England. Uh, and she's still fighting. Um, so <laughs> there, there was a question about trade unions. And there's a couple of fantastic trade union women in the, in the, in the, um, in the program. And one was a trade union called AIDWA, A-I-D-W-A. Yeah. The, the they're, yeah. they're, they're, they're sort of divided by party in, in India on the French yeah. lines, uh, unlike here where the, the trade union is a trade union and of, of, of the, you know, various forms of employment rather than by political party. Um, Correct. So they're, they're both. CPM. They're, and, yeah, yeah, CPM. They're, yeah. They're both, um, in so, yeah, they're both in India. There are trade unions that are uh, uh, trade unions that exclusively serve a certain kind of uh, workers, a certain type of employment. Um, so All India Democratic Women's Association, although uh, it is a part of uh, the communist parties in India, have always functioned as a um, women first organization. You know, they have had cases that, uh, you know, from, from female feticide to, you know, old woman abuse to everything in between. Um, and they have mostly they caste councils as well. I mean, they've done amazing work in North yes. India, really yes. astonishing work. Yeah. Yes. Similarly, in the South as well, they've done some just just some brilliant work. And now, aside from them, there is also something called the Pentorilalargal Sangam. It's a Tamil Nadu thing, which is basically women workers association, if I were to loosely translate it, Th those are for, uh, in, you know, in India, the export business is huge, right? So a lot of the, a lot of these brands in the US um, and everywhere else uh, in the world, they send a lot of menial jobs to developing countries. And most of these menial jobs, um, because apparently girls have nimble fingers, uh, these women uh, en masse get recruited and they are paid peanuts and uh, they are subjected to so much sexual violence because they're all put inside. They have this, they, it's a clockwork. You go in, you check in, and then you so, so, so for the entire day. And then when you check out, the supervisor will find all kinds of problems in cutting your salary out and things like that. So while all that was going on, Pentoraga Sangam was formed exclusively for women that are working in the garment factory. So, so many cases uh, they have fought uh, alongside IDWA or independently as a trade union. There are also trade unions uh, to cater to domestic workers, domestic help. And there are trade unions to um, uh, provide redressal for uh, uh, manual scavengers. Now, I should point out that while, while they, they, have, they have been very, very uh, supportive in, uh, in uh, helping these uh, people that are performing these jobs, it is also true that I will not say that they, for them, the criteria is women. Mm. You know, while manual scavenging as, 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 a, as a form of labor is the most profoundly humiliating, human right violating uh, form of uh, job, I would think that um, the priority is given to men going down the gutter to clean or clear out uh, the, the sewer system and everything is not the same as a woman that with her hand cleans out a dry latrine uh, in public toilets and women who, you know, people often openly defecate as well. So these are the women that have to physically collect this shit and, you know, with no, with no form, formal, um, uh, protection, no uniform, no masks, nothing with their bare hands. There's an amazing documentary called Kakus. Kakus in Tamil means uh, shit. Um, so th that's, that's a brilliant uh, documentary and I would recommend everybody to watch it. It's made by a friend of mine, Divya Bharti, another woman. So while all these organizations, trade unions and support groups exist, I personally um, 
would not go so far as to say that uh, you know they are putting women first they are putting the caste first they are putting the workers who perform those that particular uh, form of labor first but will they you know consciously put women first is something that uh, i i would wonder uh, except of course in the case of aidwa and pentorila sangam which is exclusively for women i should also point out that you know given that we live in a huge country there could be pockets uh, in rural areas and in districts that i am not familiar with and i could find out and you know get back uh, with more information on that but as far as this film's research goes the while the labor unions exist um i don't i won't confidently say that uh, they would uh, you know uh, put the women first even in the film industry there where there've been cases but i think oh. we, i'm going to move on because there was uh there were a couple of other uh, well there was one other question that's come from the audience now about um uh oh there may be some more i'm just going to check but uh, there was a question about the indian women's movement and uh the similarities and the connections between the feminist movement in india and the south asian diaspora abroad um i have some views on that i don't know about you vaishnavi uh, you know what your what your connections oh, go, go, have been go ahead. I'd, I'd, i'd like to listen to you too i i do <laughs> um well i started as i said i mean that was my that was my bringing up so i i brought you could say i'm a missionary in britain for for various things that i learned in india some of them i learned from the indian directly from the indian women's movement i mean the you know demonstrating outside houses where somebody had died and so on uh and uh, demonstrating through the town in south hall when uh you know a woman was found to have committed committed suicide i mean she complained the night before to the police about her husband uh and so on and so those techniques we brought from india and then very recently um uh well in fact after the rape case in delhi south hall black sisters organized a demonstration in which they were saying from delhi to south hall and they were again demonstrating about rape and violence against women and so on and using the inspiration of the movement in india but it's been a wider inspiration and that is about secularism and where i really do feel i'm a missionary because britain is not a secular country so india fails in its secularism but it has a secular constitution with a lot of problems in it but it does have it was not a constitution given by god there's no god in it there's no religion of the majority there are some protections there is an aspiration towards equality in it britain doesn't have a written constitution and until re recently didn't have a supreme court had a human rights act extremely recently uh you know only a few years ago and the government now is threatening to destroy it and it's a christian state it's a very irreligious very liberal country but it's a formally a christian state and there's a lot of space given to religious groups and organizing here in britain so uh i've spent a lot of my life uh, working against sharia laws in this country because there are all these informal sharia courts which are given a lot of space even though they're you know, not particularly legal but the police and various authorities listen to them uh and there's a reluctance to get rid of them even under a tory government that is seemingly anti-muslim and in fact is very bigoted but actually keeps these structures in place um and and then on the on the issue of um uh what happens to hindus dalits in this country have been fighting to have discrimination against dalits being included as a protected characteristic in the equality act which a women's place knows very well the equality act and the protected characteristics that has been a very long fight which is being supported by the secular groups in this country with by the national secular society uh by south hall black sisters and others but the but they have not succeeded because there's a very powerful hindu lobby a hindu right lobby which has argued against it uh and the government has said that we uh, are going to take this by case by case there's no need for new legislation we're not going to do it first they said we want research people did the research showed that it exists as a problem in this country then they said oh well uh there's no need for for more legislation we're going to have um we 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 we're going to take it, uh, you can take it to an employment tribunal and it could be a case by case basis now judges here are even more reluctant than in india to make case law 
of this kind if there isn't legislation. It, it, sometimes judges will do that. I, you know, there has been a tradition of progressive judgments in India as well uh, on various issues. Um, and a judge has said, and in fact, it's happened that some cases have failed, who've tried, have failed because precisely because there isn't legislation that lays it out. And the judge is saying, I'm not going to make law. You know, it's parliament that has to make law. I'm not going to do it. So this is what people have been left with, is having this heartbreaking fight, you know, in the individual against the company or another individual in a, you know, in a, in a workplace situation. Um, and it's really a sign of the power of the Hindu lobby, best expressed by the most right-wing and toxic Home Secretary that Britain has had in decades, and that's Preeti Patel, who is, you know, part of this lobby. Um, so I think the inspiration for the Indian women's movement uh, to Britain has been enormous. Um, uh, I'm not sure it's gone the other way, particularly because the same discussions have been raised in contemporary times, you know. Um, and I'm going to make uh, uh, my closing remarks. I want you to have the last word, Beshtavi. So I'm just going to say that this has been a great discussion, um, I, I, but it sort of reminded me of all the past, the past things. And I think that the battle for law and legal change has been part of a very widespread social activism. And Indian women took that activism to the UN and put the right to choice in marriage in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. That is, it doesn't mention violence against women, but it's against child rape and marriage, you know, without mentioning any of those things because they knew what they were talking about. They want adult marriage, they want choice marriage. It was also against racial segregation laws because there was no choice in marriage of racial segregation. And therefore, against inter, for intercaste marriage, or yeah, you know, yeah. without saying any of these things, people don't realize that they think that violence against women came into international discussion, you, you know, decades later, and from the West. It's not true. And at the Constituent Assembly, there was there were fifteen women in the Constituent Assembly, and young women say now, oh, there were nearly three hundred men. Why were there only fifteen women? And uh, you know. They were the first 15 women to sit in any constituent assembly anywhere. And they were all remarkable characters. And there was one Dalit woman who was in the constituent assembly as well. And two of the greatest laws that we've had, how, regardless of how badly they're implemented, as we've talked about, the Mathura case and the Bhanwari Devi case, are Dalit women whose fight went all the way to the Supreme Court and made the law, which unfortunately hasn't changed life enough, but they made a huge change in consciousness. So yeah. I want to know now, Vaishnavi, what there is for you, because in your closing remarks, I want you to say where you're, wh what you're going to be doing next. Um, so of course, like all things, my, my uh, audiovisual activism or my grassroots activism will always center women, will continue to center women. Um, the next project uh, is a bit of a controversy, um, and this was also um, this. This is at the behest of me being cancelled, uh, ca being a cancelled feminist because of my views that uh, women's sex segregated spaces is of profound importance to me. So um, I am noticing that, uh, like a lot of things. Indians are also getting influenced by the um, pediatric medicalization um, with regards to gender identity ideology and uh, things like that. So my next project is a lockdown documentary, if you will, where I have interviewed about 18 people from mostly English speaking countries um, via Zoom. And I have, uh, have about uh, pretty much 18 hours of footage with me right now, which I will put together and uh, sort of draw references from the horrible things that went wrong in um, the Gates, in Tavistock, and things that happened in the US and things like that. And I'm going to bring it back to what would happen if such a thing would happen in developing countries like India, China, or you know any other South Asian countries. So that is going to be very interesting. It's been a big debate, you know, and is a continuing debate. And I can see, I mean, actually, it popped into my mind, as you were saying it, that India would be a global center for these transitioning surgeries, because that's the way India is going in terms of its 
It cannot protect its people against a pandemic, except in the state of Kerala, where the trade union we talked about, Edwa, that government is a CPM, it's a communist government in power, and they have acted very promptly uh, in the interests of their people. They have a woman as health minister, they have excellent men and women in the civil service and so on. And they've done amazing things, which shows that you can stop people dying in a pandemic, even in a relatively poor country, if you have the political will. But, yes. but in this case, what, what India is concentrating on is surgery for the rich, elective surgeries of various kinds. That's what its medical system is doing. And people are coming from all over the world. And from surrogacy, and not just surgery, but organ transplant, surrogacy, and many other things. Yes. Please go and watch this film. And uh, money towards it will go towards the next film, towards translating uh, Vaishnavi's projects, uh, which, is a, which is a huge and really did in India. Um, and I want to thank Women's Place for having me do this conversation because I've loved doing it. Mm -hmm. And to thank Vaishnavi for coming on. And I think Ali was going to wind up for us. Is that right, Ali? I, I was, but of course I didn't want to interrupt because the conversation has been so incredibly rich. Um, I think it's wonderful that, that you two have been able to come on this platform today. I think that um, definitely the three of us, Women's Place UK, Vaishnavi uh, and, and Geeta, we all share um, the experience of um, being cancelled, kicked back cancel culture as a direct result of your feminist activism and your, your strong advocacy for the sex rights of women and girls. Um, so it's been really exhilarating. I know the subject matter has obviously been quite challenging um, throughout, but it has been such a pleasure to listen to you two in conversation and to hear such knowledgeable feminist activists talking about such an important, such an important issue. So sincerely thank you. Um, Thank you to everybody that's come and, and participated today. Um, I'm really sorry we haven't got through as many questions as we wanted to, um, but maybe we can, we can work something out um, with that. And thank you for all the amazing contributions that have come in on the chat as well. There's some really good links up there. So um, we'll, we'll save that, save everything that's come up on the chat and make sure that we get it all back out to you again. Um, the Women's Place UK hashtag has been really interesting as well. So thank you all. Um, and just to repeat again what you said, Gita, uh, Gita um, please watch the film. It's on the Eventbrite original email. And if you're watching this on YouTube in the future, there should be a link underneath this. So have a click and see if you can find it. Um, so yes, yeah, so on behalf of Women's Place UK, and I think everybody in the audience, Thank you both so much. Send our love to Chennai. It must be getting quite late there now. And um, love to you in London as well, uh, Geeta. And thank you all very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much.